Cool. Let's do this. So we're going to, everything we've done up until this point has very much been about everything being nice and linear. We're going to start now doing non-linear data. So we're going to start with a little bit of polynomial regression to step you in, step functions, then we'll get to splines, we'll do cubic splines, natural splines, smoothing splines, then we'll do local regression splines or LOIS. Then what we're going to do, we're going to have a little bit of a break from that to actually see some standard methods, so we'll do GAMS, and then we'll do something completely different called non-linear regression. That one will all be done this week, that has a break. So, um, next week and the week after is the mid-semester break. Usual thing, as far as I can see when it comes to your education, them two weeks do not exist. What that means is you now have four weeks to do your next assignment. Because normally every assignment you get two weeks, yes? That two weeks of your mid-semester break just inserts in that and just pushes that two weeks apart. So your next assignment will be due, I've already put it online, will be due in the Friday of week seven. So, um, altogether we will have five assignments. So you've got, you've done two now, we've got three more. Um, this one has some web scraping for you, um, that's about it, and now I'm writing an assignment four, but I haven't quite finished that. Assignment four has some S3, a little bit of, I think, some Mars, stuff like that. Cool. So, polynomial regression. Let's recap polynomial regression. So, to do this, we're going to look at the wage data. The wage data is looking at how much salaries people get paid, and we have various predictors. The year of the salary, the age of the person getting it, their marital status, their race, their education, the region in America, their job class, their health, their health insurance, um, and I've got the log of wage and wage there that we're going to look at. And wage, as you can see, I think is in thousands of dollars. So I'm interested in this one. Here we've got wage on the y-axis and we have yeah, wage on the y-axis and age on the x-axis. And you can see that it doesn't seem to be, there's, there's a curve there and also you've got some points up at the top that really stick out. Points at the top, when I had a look at them, um, education seems to be one of the big things that is uh, coloured by that. So. Think about the standard linear model. Our standard linear model would be that yi equals b to zero plus b to one x i plus our noise term. So how do we deal when we want polynomials in there? Well, we just add them in. So here's your standard d degree polynomial term. And when you first see that in second year, you get confused because we keep saying this is a linear model. And you go, no, it's not. It's got polynomial terms. But it is a linear model. We, we say the phrase is linear in the coefficients. What we mean is your y is a linear combination of the predictors. The fact that the predictors are square terms and cube terms, etc., doesn't make any difference. The main fact is it's a linear combination of those predictors. Fine. So, how do we fit this model? Well, there's a couple of ways. Here's the, the one you may have seen before, where what we do is we use our LM model, we go wage equals age, and then you've got I age tilde two. Well, carrot two actually, not tilde. So first of all, the reason we put that I is the identity function. Because the carrot, the power of two, has a special meaning in formulae within R. It's to do with interaction terms. So you have to say, no, what I really want to do is I want you to take that column and I want you to just square every term. So the I is saying, don't treat that caret as a special formula notation. Use it as a square term or a Q term or a fourth term, etc. All fine. No problem. Some of you may have gone beyond that because you've had to do big polynomials and learn how to do the poly function. Poly A4. And what this do is it will give me a polynomial up to and including a degree four. The problem is it doesn't actually do what you think it's doing. The poly actually, and you'll notice that if you looked at the coefficients there, 
the observant in you would have noticed that they're very different to the coefficients here. So, what's happening? Well, what the poly does is it gives you a set of orthogonal polynomials. Okay, so let's explain what an orthogonal polynomial is in a rough stage. So, I've said this before, but if you have a model, if you're not sure what it's doing, get your model matrix. Actually break it down and have a good look. So up to here, I've got a very simple example to illustrate orthogonal polynomials. So here, I've got H is the values 1 to 5, and I've done a model matrix with the age, the uh, quadratic, and the cubic. And you can see it is exactly what you expect. The first column is your intercept, the second column is just age, the third column is obtained by taking that age and element-wise just squaring it. And the third one, again, you take age and element-wise you cube it. So it, it makes sense, okay? And all I've done here is I've plotted the values of their terms. So on the x-axis, I've got the values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then on the y-axis, I get the value you get on each of them columns. So the intercept are all at 1, and then your age, your squared, etc. Make sense? And notice as age gets large, a lot of them columns start getting really huge numbers in it, which is a bit of a problem. Here's your poly. So that looks very, very weird. But what do I mean by orthogonal? So that first one there is actually a linear set of points. So if you plot that against age as you go up, you'll see that it forms a line. But if I take any of these last three columns and I multiply them by each other, I get zero. They're orthogonal to one another. So I've proven that by just quickly grabbing the matrix M and just doing transpose the matrix times the matrix. And notice all the off-diagonal terms are zero, and the diagonal, except the very first term, all equal to one. So basically, it's created a linear function, a quadratic function, and a cubic function, that when you multiply them together, first of all, they're all of length one, and when you multiply them together, you get zero. They are orthogonal to one another. Now, I've done exactly the same plot as I did before, where I've got my x-axis, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I've got the intercept, so that takes the values 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. My first one, notice the green points form a straight line. The cyan points make a nice quadratic. And finally, the purple ones are making a nice, I mean, it's very discrete type, but a nice little cubic. So that's what happens when you do poly. Poly is actually creating you the squared term, the cubic term, the fourth root term, but it's creating them such that when you multiply two together, they're at right angles to one another. They are orthogonal. Now, that doesn't mean you can't use poly if you really don't want the orthogonal. If you just go comma time equals raw, it will give you exactly what you had before, where it would actually do the standard polynomial. And do these things give you different models? So I went and fitted the model with the um, using the, all the um, terms and the one with the poly, and I've compared them with um, the prediction of the points, and you can see that they are identical. Interpretation is always going to be different with polynomial. Using the orthogonal, even though it seems a very complicated thing, is probably the best one to do. And also, it saves you a hell of a lot of typing. So here's my actual data set now. This is with the, um, I can never quite remember the right word for the fourth one, printing? Quartic. So this is the quartic, and you can see that it follows quite nicely. I've added some error bars on there. So you can see towards the right, we have a lot of variability, but it fits the data well. It doesn't, it doesn't look like it fits it well, but it does fit the data okay. So I could have that term in there, and I could do prediction. You can also do this for logistic regression. All I've done here is I've added an extra um, Boolean variable, which basically says if you earn more than 250,000, then I'm going to call you an earner. If you're less than that, you are not. And again, I can do my general linear model of earner on poly age four, etc. And when I see that, you can now see there's your prediction 
as age increases or the probability of being a high earner. Okay, so as you first start in sort of non-linear, you've got a nice curve function there. But let's improve it. So the problem with polynomial is you're assuming you've got this global structure. And that's usually fine in the sense of the data, but you find this starts going a bit crazy once you get away from the majority of your data. You find often it fits very nice and it gets to the edge, especially when you have high order polynomials, you get this real wiggly behavior in your function. And sometimes we'd just like to sort of go, well, I could really do with a value in the middle, slightly different to the value either side. So you'd like to have more local structures. And so what we're going to do, first of all, is we're going to start by doing a piecewise constant. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break my data into bins and then fit a model which have different constant values for each of the bins. So now I can have a bit more of a local structure. So here's the notation. We're going to have what we call cut points. We're going to have k of them, c1 up to ck. And I'm going to have a new variable. So c0x is when you're given the value of a predictor, Basically, C0 is going to be 1 if my predictor is less than that first cutoff point C1 and 0 elsewhere. C1 now says if my um, x lies between, sorry, that should be C, then 2 should be x and x. If x lies between C1 and C2, it's 1 out 0. So I've got a series of Bernoullis which have a value of either 0 or 1. And it's 1 if you're in that interval, and it's 0 elsewhere. So basically, I have a whole list of these which tell me which bin I sit within. And obviously, a point can only lie in one bin. I set these bins up so they don't overlap. Hence, if I take all these various functions and add them together, I should be 0 for all of them except for 1. So the sum of them should always be 1 because I am allowed to be in one bin and I have to be in at least one bin. Notice I've set up so the endpoints covered everything. So here's my new model. Again, it's a linear model. I got y, it's got an intercept plus b to 1 times that first function all the way up to b to k, c k. You might say, well, where's C0? C0 is the intercept. Because if you're not in the rest, you'll be in that intercept. How do I do it? Well, there's lots of different ways of doing it. So I've illustrated all of them. So the classic one, if you've seen it before, is as a cut function. In cut function, you can actually give the breaks. So I said my bins are 0 to 30, 30 to 60, 60 to 90. Notice the way it does it is on the age bin is it has a soft left hand margin and a hard right hand margin. So basically that's saying I'm greater than zero but I'm less than or equal to 30. Also, there's also cut interval, cut number, cut width, depending on what you want to do. So first of all, what cut interval does, if I go age three, it says I want to take the entire range and I want you to split it into three bins of equal width. Cut number says take the data and split it into three bins such that each bin has the same number of observations. And finally, cut width there says cut it into intervals such that every interval has a width of three. So the first one just cut it and you, you have 33 so gave the points. The second one of all equal width. The third one equal numbers of observations. And finally, I can actually say, no, I've cut into bins and I want all the bins to have the same width, depending on what I want to look at. But basically what it's doing is it's taking each of my observations and it's converting it into a categorical variable where it gives you the level, and that level will then be represented as a 0, 1 vector. And now I can just regress on that. 
So here I can do my first one where I just wage on age bin, or I can do wage step earners on age bin. And when I look at their models, here's my nice little step function of the three. And all it's done is it's fitted, it's taken that data and it's worked out the average of all the observations in that bin, and it gives me a straight line. Then it went to the next bin, gave me a straight line, and the final one. And you notice I gave it the knots at this point. I turned my well, cutoff points we're using so far, I'll change that in a second, but I gave it the cutoff point. I said, usually from understanding of the research question, what bins I wanted. I'm not letting R decide them. Now, this diagram's a bit of a lie. Notice it seems to imply that it's constant and then it has a nice, very steep slope. That's because it's decided to help me and join them two bits. Don't think about that way. It's actually a load of piecewise constants. It has a value, and then once it gets its new bit, it jumps straight up. Comes across, once it gets a new bit, it drops straight down. So that continuity that's just part of me using G online is a lie. So you, in this case, if you wanted to predict, you'd say, which age, which bin are you in? So if my age was about 21, I go, fine, that's the bin you're at. So you're predicted to have that line as your value. Here's the same with my logistic regression with my bins. And again, the fact that the black line that's continuous is a line. It should be a horizontal line, then it jumps, horizontal line, and then it jumps. It's a discontinuous predictor. So, so far, we've looked at taking our predictors and squaring them, and then our predictors and binning them. And these are both examples of what we call basis functions. So what do I mean by that? We're going to consider a family of functional transformations that will take your predictors and they will convert them somehow. And we will name them B1 up to BK. And then once we've got these transformations, we can then just fit our model where now our transformed data are our predictors in a linear model. And these bases will come back to find as numerous times, especially when we get to support vector distributions. So we've got some sort of transformation, and then once we've got a transformation, we're now going to look at a linear combination of transformations. And even though I didn't say this, you could have thought of our PCR from last week as a time for this thing. <coughs> Often in this form, we take each predictor separately, but in that case, with the PCA, we're taking all the predictors together to give our transformations. So in the case of polynomial, our basis function, our J basis function, was I just take Xi and I raise it to the power J. On our piecewise constant, our basis function was just an indicator function saying, do I lie in the J interval? But again, note that they are fixed and known. We decide these basis functions at the start. We're not letting the data decide it for us. Often we've decided the cutoff, the binning is from some sort of understanding of the problem we're looking at. So, at the moment, we have these piecewise constant. We're going to improve and say, well, maybe we could start having polynomials that we piece together. So we're going to have a piecewise polynomial. So what you can do is you can take a low degree polynomial. So in this case, I've given a cubic. And what you do is for you, you go back to the idea of taking your data and put it into bins. And then you're right for the first bin, I'm going to fit a cubic. I'm going to go to the second bin and fit a cubic. And the third bin. So every bin gets its own little cubic. Now, a cubic means an intercept, a linear coefficient, a quadratic, a cubic coefficient. So altogether, each cubic needs four parameters. Plus, we're going to have a Norris term, so we'll have a sigma as well. So in this case, we've got altogether eight parameters plus a sigma. And obviously, I'm going to need four parameters for each bin plus that um, Norris term. 
Now, we normally don't do this. It took me a while to work out how I could actually force R to do it. So what I've done here is I've fitted a polynomial and I've got an interaction term with the age bins. So this is my piecewise cubic. So I fitted that using that model with an interaction term. And then here is my fitted data. What I've done here is I've colored by the bins. You can't see very well, but you can see there's a cubic, then another cubic, and then the final cubic. But there's a problem here. It, we're not very happy with this. I mean, this is why I had to force R to do it. Notice that red cube, it goes along, and then there seems to be a bit of a jump down. In fact, we had this with the piecewise constant. You sort of come along, and then it jumps. And it just doesn't quite look right. It's not quite what we want. It'd be much nicer if at least this single line, we had a single continuous line that the value should meet. So we're going to do that. We're going to actually add some constraints. So we don't like the jumps. So the first thing we could do is we can impose the constraint that at least the cubic on one bit from the left and the cubic on the other bit meet. And the big place where they meet, we call a knot now. We've gone from cut off to calling it a knot. So that's fine, but if you think about it, they could meet, but they could look like that. They could have a bit of a spike. So why don't we have it that they, not only are they the same value where they meet, they have the same first derivative. And in fact, the first second derivative. And we're going to call this C2 smooth. Or so you're going to say the function is smooth because it meets and the first derivative and the second derivative are all fine. Of course, every time that we do this and we make them match, we lose a degree of freedom because there's not as much flexibility on that cubic. If it has to meet, you lose a degree of freedom. If it has to be first derivative continuous and second derivative continuous, you lose altogether three degrees of freedom. And because this is such a common thing, we're going to say that if you have a piecewise cubic that's continuous and also continuous in the first derivative and the second derivative, we're going to call that a cubic spline. In fact, if I have a spline that is of degree d and it's piecewise, degree d polynomial with continuity and derivatives up to degree y to 1, we'll call that a degree d spline. We pretty well always use just cubics. Cubic spline is the classic. There is an argument that once you get up to the second derivative being smooth, that's as smooth as the human eye is quite happy with. Once you get to the cubic, we, the human eye seems to look at it and go, yeah, that looks, that's a nice, pleasing line. Is there an argument as to why we odd powered polynomial, but it starts, the direction ends up in? Not that no one. It just seems everyone says the cubic is just a nice looking one. I mean, one because there's a lot less, it's, it's large enough that you get that nice smooth curve while not going over the top. So I think it's um, a balance now between computational and yes, it looks nice. Well, they always seem to fit better though, right? So when, when, when you got Octo in my first year and you would manually fit, you try and fit cubic and a quarter, and the cubic one is always fit one. I was thinking more of the, the quarter, like if it has a if it starts, it really has to come back down. So yeah, yeah well, this one. Yeah, they pick it back up. This yeah. Other way, there was some argument somewhere. But, but you remember the middle cubic? Um, it could be flipped over. Mm. As long as it's continuous in the, the first three, it still could be. So it doesn't have to always go like that. It could sort of go like that. And then I suppose it can. I think it could go like that. Yeah, I don't know. Just curious. Yeah. yeah. But I haven't seen anything that says the odd powers. Definitely they talk about the fact that you don't know anything beyond the cubic because that looks good enough. Yeah. But no one says, and by the way, because it's odd, it has this. So. Okay. Yeah. So how do we actually do this in reality? Well, what we do first of all is we're going to set up a load of basis functions. In fact, we're going to have our intercept and then we're going to have k plus three basis functions. And the easiest way of doing it in cube science, we're going to do what we call the truncated power basis function. So it's this thing here. So it's h, it takes a predictor and a xi, 
And basically, he says x minus psi, so psi is your naught cubed, and then notice the little plus. All that means is, if I'm less than psi, I set it to zero. If I'm greater, I have the cubic. Why would you use that letter? The whole rig out that choose from you chose that letter. I didn't choose that letter. You have to write that out now. That's an easy one. Oh, yeah, you right. go like you that. I don't have a thingy, oh. majiggy, what's the matter? It just looks like a cyclone in my head. Yeah, actually, it's not that bad. It's an E, and then you just curl. No, mine doesn't look like a tornado. Zeta's <laughs> a little bit harder, because you always get that wrong, but it is seriously. Do an E, and then just curl. Nah, I'm not happy with it. Look at me. It can't be wrong. There's probably a reason. It's actually not the worst one to do. Row is the worst one for me because I'm just, I just get, all the time I get told off by Ben because it's not quite right. But it's well, very easy to type as well. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's fine. So, what does it look like? I've shown you the code here because I wanted to show you something that uh, a couple of things on this slide, but nothing to do with the truncated power function. So, first of all, notice I made myself a little function there. That's all fine. Little hat function takes an x, takes a xi, use a nice if else to return either the cubic or zero. Okay. Next thing is, some of you may have seen, if any of you ever used the curve function in R, it's really good for quickly drawing a curve, sort of in the name. So ggplot has the same version. Notice here, I've got a stat underscore function. So if you look at my first one, my data frame, I've just gone from x equals zero to five. I haven't given any y or anything, and I've just given that setting of x. If I had a stat function, I can actually pass any function I want in there. I could do d norm, I can do any of these things, I can do x squared, and it will just plot that function for me. So it's a very quick way of plotting a curve. Well, like our case, I have a parameter. I press, press the parameters using the art, so I just write a list of them. The other thing I wanted to show you was, notice when I did color, it looks like I've got some LaTeX in there. I've got the dollar, I've got the dollar. The only thing is, instead of going backslash Xi, I've got double backslash. And then notice it automatically in my slide has actually done the LaTeX for me. This is because in our markdown, if at any particular individual R, you go comma dev, D-E-F, equals ticks, T-I-K-Z, it will automatically convert that picture into ticks and then automatically compile it into um, the proper version for you. So if you ever actually want to annotate a picture, then you can put the LaTeX directly in your ggplot2, but as long as you basically go dev equals ticks, you get pretty things. Notice though, it does give you the standard LaTeX computer modern font, which is why you might notice that these look a little bit different. So, easy ways to look at functions, easy ways to get your LaTeX in your picture if you're using R Markdown. If you don't use R Markdown, you're using LaTeX, you can still do it. There's a thing called, a package called Tix Device, you can take any image in R and export it as TIX and then compile that as a PDF or you can just read it directly in. So if you ever want to just put LaTeX directly on a picture, go and look at TIX device. Cool. So that's the beside. What we notice is this is just a cubic and basically the first one, the red line, basically takes zero until it gets to one and then you get this nice cubic appearing. Well, the other one basically takes zero until we get to three, and then it starts to get that cubic. How do we use that? Well, here's our basis functions. Our first prediction is going to be x, then x squared, then x cubed, and then we use that truncated cubic. In reality, you use the splines package and you have the BS for basis spline. The default basis spline is the cubic spline. It's not, it's basis, basis spline. Not any other acronym whatsoever on that BS function. Basis function. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Be here all week. Trying to be all.
So you just wrap it around. So you give your predictor age. In this case, I gave it the knots at 30 and 60. Now, unfortunately, there's a little bit of faffing you have to do. R tries to be clever and it has an extra what it calls boundary knots and things like that. So it doesn't quite match the logic you think it should have. It's because it adds an extra thing. You can actually say, I want degrees of three to be equal to, and give it the value. But it does seem to add in extra knots in there automatically as part of its default behavior. The hardest thing I find, these are really, really nice for sort of going, here's my knots, fit this thing. It's got a lot of flexibility within the shape of the predictor going in there. But as always, once we get flexibility, we lose the ability to explain and interpret. So I, will, I don't use splines that much. In case you've had really hard data, it's in there. But you lose that really nice ability to explain what the relationships are. The standard one where you're just going to go and have a look at the fitted function. So here's that cubic spline. And it looks pretty good. You know, it seems to fit the data. We get quite a bit of flaring of the standard error bars at the right hand side. And in fact, that is often seen. Spines will often have high variance in the boundaries of X. So if you get to the edges of your data, you find you get a lot of variability within them. So they invented a thing called a natural spline. And what you do is you take that cubic spline you had before, and what you do is at the end, instead of it being cubic, you set the bits outside the outside knots to be linear. So you think you've gone from a cubic at each end, and you've gone down to linear, so you've lost two degrees of freedom. So before you had with k knots k plus four, now you get down to k degrees of freedom. How do you do natural splines? The same package, the spline package, but now you do NS. So now I've got natural splines, age is my predictor, degrees of freedom are set to three. Fit it automatically, and then when I did my fitted, what I've done here is you can see the difference. Notice you, you can't see, unfortunately, it's not dark enough. I should have set it dark. You can't see the bounds as well, but the bounds for the natural are not as flared, the blue ones, as the red ones. And you found, notice how it really sort of dips down quite quickly with the cubic spline or the natural spline. You don't get that as much. So that's it for the introduction to splines. Next time we're going to start doing smoothing splines, Lois, and I think Mars as well. Go on, you got a question, Ben? What are we saying here? We are hypothesizing that there's a different relationship in the data at these points that we just made up. I mean, I could draw a line on it with texture as well, right? That it yep. Right through the yep, absolutely. And that's effectively what we've done. Yes. So you could, in reality, you could try different knots. You could say, I'm going to have knots being even through my data, or maybe you, I mean, the, the other one you will sometimes do is you will take your data and you will use the quartiles or, you know, various percentiles as your knots, put that in, and then fit the data. So you're allowing a lot of flexibility in describing how that age varies. Um, and then you could check it by using something like cross-validation. Okay, so, so all so we're doing at this point is we're saying we could take our data and we will have a lot of flexibility in that relationship between, in this case, wage and age by allowing that we could have local cubics stitched together. Now, could we move knots around and track the MSE or something? Or? Yep, absolutely. Just you could say just that... We've got like random... Yep, yep. Um, why is Tuesday 60 and mine too scared? Um, I chose 30-60 purely for educational, here's the simple knots. Um, how I would actually choose knots, first of all, I would say, do you expect certain behavior? So sometimes in the data, they might, someone might say, look, we know that, so the one I've seen this recently, and we'll get to when we do Mars, is looking at bone growth. 
in humans. And that in that case, they said, well, we know that you have children for this age, and then teenagers, and then adults. So there was something from the, the actual context of the problem that said, yes, we think this is where you, we should have the slightly different models. Um, if you don't have that, then it might be a matter of just trying multiple knots. So often I, I'm more likely in this case to say, I will let R decide by, instead of saying my knots will be here, just say, I want the degrees of freedom to be, I'm happy to spend, say, 10 degrees of freedom on this particular predictor. So you, instead of just going ns and then the knots, I go ns degrees equals 10, and let it decide where to put the knots. I would then perhaps go, well, maybe I need more flexibility, so I'll give more degrees of freedom. So then now I would do, and I'll show you this when I did the lowest, because um, I actually wrote some code for that. This I don't use much, but the lowest I do, where I actually used a tuning parameter and then did an AIC corrected to choose the best parameter in the span on that one. Right. So again, it's, you, you have a lot of flexibility, but how you decide, either expert knowledge or different knots, or in this case, different degrees of freedom, and then try exploring that degrees of freedom with using something like cross-validation or some measure of goodness of fit. And it comes back down to that, that thing we keep discussing of, do I want explanation or do I want prediction? All I care is prediction, who cares what the knots are? Find the best knot to give you the best prediction once you take into account that you want the test mean square error, not the training mean square error. Explanation, if they really believe, for example, the stages of life and you want to have different models for the different stages of life, then that absolutely dictates. You'd like to know what that relationship is for, you know, young, teenage, adult. Right. So it only makes sense to do it if there's some kind of a natural bifurcation in the data. Yeah, I mean, I'm if, if, if there isn't a natural bifurcation in data, I don't use splines at all. I do use lowest. I have used lowest in examples where I had this data that I knew the relationship wasn't a simple, easy thing, and I wanted to take that into account, let the data speak for itself, so I, in that case, used lowest. The one we're talking about is smoothing splines, which also have a lot of flexibility. So splines I would do, personally, would do, if someone came along and said that we know here's where we want to have the knots, fine. Right. If, they, if they're not sure, I'd always go for personally smoothing splines or lowest. Cool. Okay, thank you. Excellent. So we have a lecture on Wednesday. We have a workshop this Friday. The workshop this Friday um, is on data table. So again, go and have a look at the slides, make sure if you haven't got it, you've looked it up. Basically data table is really, really fast data manipulation. It gives you something very SQL-like. So we'll cover that, which you will definitely, for assignment three, you definitely need to come to the workshop because if you try and do assignment three without data table, you will either crash your computer or not have it finished doing the commands by the time you submit the assignment. Good luck. <laughs> what about the Phoenix? Phoenix? Pardon? What about the Phoenix? No, okay. The only thing that makes me clear is the parallel. I remember Tidyverse is not made to be parallel. There is, once we get to Spark, and we do Sparkly R in the last workshop, you'll see player like functions that are actually made to work on multiple cores. Yeah, sure. Each core must be fairly because you're on new app. Really? Yeah. Oh, it's just that it has a shitload of memory. Yeah. And a lot of storage. And uh, as I said, the last workshop, we now have access to Rolling. I have money set aside for you, and we will get you to in that workshop, hopefully, if everything goes according to plan, get you to all spin up a machine on the Amazon cloud server and have a go of playing with some data. That's assuming I can get it all to work and get you all invites working. But should do. Cool. See you all Wednesday.